Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of How to Live to 200, where we focus on the science and practice of health, human performance, and longevity. On today's episode, I had the opportunity to speak with Wade Lightheart, a decorated bodybuilder who believes that eating a raw, vegan diet is optimal for health, reducing inflammation, and the microbiome. So for all of you who ask me and other vegetarians where we get the protein to build muscle, this will be an excellent episode for you. We also discuss how and why he uses enzymes and amino acids as critical supplements to support his digestion and physical and mental performance. The superfoods he reaches for when he's traveling around the world. The details of his meditation practice, which goes well beyond an app and includes some very cool breathing techniques. And how he uses a machine that produces water of various pH levels to do everything from creating optimal drinking water to a disinfectant to removing oil-based residue from his vegetables. That's right, he has a unique water for each of these purposes. This was the first guest to go deep on water, and I thought it was fascinating. As a vegetarian performance athlete myself, I love talking to others who are using plant-based nutrition to fuel their fitness, even if I can't imagine not eating a cooked piece of food for two years like Wade did when he first adopted his diet. But if we're going to live to 200, it's another reason to be doing everything we can to support our planet's longevity. If you like this one, you'll be excited about a soon-to-be-released episode with Dr. Will Cole, where he explains what a ketotarian is and how you can become one too. Just another example of a vegan or vegetarian approach toward longer and better living. Subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and get alerted when these new episodes come out. And now, this is how to live to 200. So, Wade, welcome to the show. Great to be here. So, tell me, why bodybuilding? Well, you know, bodybuilding happened to me accidentally. Um, Basically, when I was 15, three unique things happened to me. And that was my parents moved from the little village that we lived in. We lived in a small village in uh, New Brunswick, kind of Canada, on the east coast of Canada, very rural, very much like Maine. And um, we moved to uh, a beautiful lake. My dad was a caretaker for a, a wealthy businessman. And so it was five miles to the nearest neighbor up a dirt road on a mountain. And uh, so I was in extreme isolation. So that was a life-changing event that happened. Simultaneously, shortly afterwards, my sister was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, which is a form of cancer of the lymph nodes. And um, she was four years my senior. And I watched her over four years go through you know, all the chemotherapy and radiation and surgeries and all that sort of stuff before she died at an early age at 22. And then the other thing that happened is she gave me a bodybuilding magazine around the same time. She had a picture of Troy Zuclata who had won Mr. California and these two pretty girls on the cover and, you know, being 15 years old, nothing to do and going driven by mad out of testosterone and no, nobody around. Uh, I decided I better get some muscles. Maybe I could get girls like this. It was a pretty rudimentary hook that Joe Weider pulled off. And uh, I started lifting. I built a gym in my barn and started working out with weights. And, and you know, in a, in a time when you're a teenager, oftentimes it's a time of transition from, you know, childhood into more of a mature perspective. And there's a lot of anger and a lot of frustration. And there was a lot of things that I couldn't control in my life at this time, where I live, the illness of my sister, um, you know, the isolation. But uh, with bodybuilding, I found that there was something I could control in that little bit of being able to work out, change my physique, read about people like Arnold Schwarzenegger and that sort of stuff and what they did. And I really identified with the ability uh, or, or the self-empowerment side of the sport. And and later on, uh, I didn't realize that it was going to grow into a career on its own. And when did, when did raw and vegan enter your life and in your bodybuilding career? Yeah, that happened um, after the 2003... Mr. Universe contest where I had prepared for 10 months on very, I had been a vegetarian and um, I was trying to apply a vegetarian mentality, if you will, to a, uh, or a meat eating mentality to a vegetarian dietary practice as I competed for that contest. Now, bodybuilding contest is much different than bodybuilding itself. Bodybuilding sounds as what it is. You're building up your physique, developing your muscles. It's very aesthetic, but competitions are very extreme and very hard on the body because you're putting to, you know, 
very, very low levels of body fat, which isn't entirely healthy, as is no sports really healthy. You have fitness and health, are two different things. We'll get into that a little later. But after that contest, I gained 42 pounds of fat and water in 11 weeks after the Mr. Universe. So I like to say I went from Mr. Universe to Mr. Marshmallow. And uh, it was devastating. You know, I had spent 16 years of my life dedicating myself to a sport. Um, and there was something I missed. I didn't know what it was. And I met a doctor by the name of Dr. Michael O'Brien. And he started teaching me about, he, he said to me, I said, you know, what happened to him? And he was famous for correcting all the illnesses of all these people. And he says, well, wait, you learn, you've learned to build the body from the outside in. You haven't learned to build the body from the inside out. And he started teaching me about digestive enzymes and probiotics and, you know, superfoods and things like that. No one had ever heard of this stuff back in 2003. Nobody was talking about this and, or almost no one. And uh, that was radical for me. So I went on a completely raw food diet largely in part because of the enzymatic components of eating a raw food diet, removing any cooked foods and stuff, which is very restrictive. And I did that for a period of two years uh, of experimenting where I, I never ate a piece of cooked food in two years. So it was a, it was a radical experiment where I learned a lot. Fun, a fun date. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what has your diet evolved to now? What would be a normal day, week, month uh, for you in terms of this vegan performance uh, approach? Well, it's going to vary. Um, I tend to cycle um, between my dietary choices based on where I'm living. Um, obviously, it's easier to maintain a more raw food diet if you're in a warm climate than if you're in a cold climate. First on food availability and also just the environmental conditions. Colder climates tend to prefer more a, a little bit higher acidic based diet for a variety of reasons and warmer climates tend to respond better to a more fruit based diet um and there's some you know there's some nuances within that if you're trying to get something for cosmetic purposes versus strength purposes versus endurance purposes so i i think depending on what i'm working on in a particular time would determine what the constitute of my day might be so but for most times I'll get up in the morning and right now I'm doing a lot of experimenting with intermittent fasting. So I will consume between either a one hour window or a six hour window, depending on the output for that, that day. So I'll get up in the morning, I'll go through um, my morning routine. I'll go to the gym, work out, do some cardio, do some stretching, come home and then I'll have maybe a cup of tea and a few amino acids. I always take enzymes and stuff before my workouts. And then later on, I'll have maybe a, a vegetarian, like vegan protein, pea, hemp, and um, pumpkin, for example, combination of, of protein with, say, uh, an apple or some potatoes or some, some sort of carb, uh, and then maybe a little bit of fat. And then in the afternoon, I'll have what I call a rainbow salad, which is to put it into context. If you go to Whole Foods and spend about $30 on your salad, then that's what you get. So it's a, it's a really big salad. And I try to put as many colors in that salad as possible. And that'll have everything from, you know, pecans and walnuts and, you know, all different kinds of uh, green foods and carrots and beets and, you know, just everything you can imagine uh, inside of that. And then usually in the evenings is where I'll have something usually a little warmer. Like I might have some um, a more warm vegetarian dish, whether it's a you know cooked version of potatoes and rice and, and another protein source or lentils or something like that. Because I find it, I, I like a little bit more of a, a heated spice. It tends to bring me down in the day. And then periodically through the day, I, I'll take vegan amino acids as well, because I've really found because I have such low protein contents that that is really good for sustaining my energy. Now, if I'm not working out, then I would go and just have maybe one big meal that day. But that's been an evolution over a lot of times I've gone through partial vegetarian where I'll use like if I'm traveling, I'll oftentimes have eggs because I don't have availability of a lot of things. So um, I'll go that and, and then if I have a, a cheat meal or a cheat day, Usually if I have a cheat or uh, a refeed, I like to call them um, that day, then all then everything's nothing's barred on that day. I can have whatever I want. So if I want some cheese or I want some chips or if I want, 
you know, anything that I would be tempted to eat during the week, I'll save it up for that one day a week. And the goal of that week is to get my calorie intake, you know, at least, at least to, uh, 6,000 calories. And if not, if I can get it higher, the better. And the reason why that is, is because I want to create metabolic flexibility. Anytime you go on a restrictive dietary process, whether it's a regular five or six meals a day, which I've done, or three meals a day, or one meal a day, um, you're in a form of, and you're in a form of calorie restriction. So if I'm burning, say 3000 calories a day, I want to be in a ca- thousand calorie deficit. So I would cap it at 2000. But oftentimes if you're doing one meal a day, it's hard to get that 2000 in one meal. You might be down to 1500. And the key to long-term success in dieting is not to slow down your metabolism. And so by having the refeed day, what you do is number one, you, you don't develop a adverse psychological kind of judgment around foods that may be not on the menu. And I think that can be very detrimental to people's health and vitality and, and function. And number three, you're, you're actually s- systematically or strategically calorie boosting so that you push your metabolism and you don't get that metabolic slowdown so that you can maintain your uh, weight and body fat levels over an extended period of time. Let's come back to the um, difference between muscle gain and endurance. Do you vary your diet significantly or for people you work with during the an, an approach toward muscle or strength gain yeah. versus endurance? Yeah, absolutely. So, for example, if people are um, in more of an endurance side, chances are they're going to do best on a very low glycemic um, carbohydrate or no carbohydrate intake or, or a ketogenic diet simply because – you want to ensure that your body is in more in ketosis or is using fats to metabolize. So it makes sense to eat a diet that's more supportive of that. It also reduces uh, you know, insulin levels and things like that and gets people into more of an endurance-based mode all the time. And I think that does very well for people in kind of endurance type base. Like I got a friend who follows a, sim- a diet uh, similar to that who's, uh, you know, he went from 200 and 70 pounds to like 175 and now he runs marathons, you know, um, at, at, and he started this at, you know, 45 years old and now he's 50 and is able to accomplish that in five years. But for a bodybuilding diet or a muscle building diet, the number one growth factor when it comes to building muscle is insulin. And so personally, I believe that, um, having, if I was to be looking to gain more weight, I would have what I call higher glycemic carbs with my proteins, and I would only add my essential fatty acids in in a strategic manner, not necessarily in the same meal. So to give you an example, I would take, you know, rice, or um, potatoes or rice cakes, even something that's going to spike my insulin levels quite high, and I would take a higher amount of protein at that time, anywhere from, you know, 30 to 50 grams, depending on the person size, body weight, all that sort of stuff at that time, because I want the insulin to drive that which is a very anabolic hormone into the body. So it's again, and I would tend to eat uh, smaller, more frequent meals, which is common in the bodybuilding world. Now there is a, there is a, a, a new movement that's happening where you, you do intermittent fasting for say six hours in the bodybuilding world. And you're still putting in those, those high glycemic carbs, but you're, you're still getting the benefits of, uh, you know, uh, the fasting process, which, you, which, uh, we're experimenting down. There may be some hormonal benefits of that as well. Go, let's go back to the amino acids, the, the additives you take. What are those? What brand do you use? How often do you take them? Do they vary on the different? Uh, you know, I have, I've been experimenting with a variety of vegan amino acids. So uh, right now I, I haven't found the one, I would say the one that I think is the ultimate. What I would say is I do like products that don't contain um, artificial sweeteners like aspartame, for example, I'll, I prefer to have them sweetened with things like stevia or monk fruit. I think they're a superior sweetener and don't have the negative side effects of some of those um, high calorie sweeteners. Now, that being said, a lot of people like the high calorie sweetener. So if I had a choice between the two, like whether I was going to eat them or not, I would take the, I've, I've tried some of the other ones, you know, with sucralose and things like that. And they, they taste great, but um, the, the jury has indicated that those might not be so good for your gut health and microbiome over the long term. So that's how I arrange those. What's, what's your m- current most favorite and how do you feel different when you take one that you like or don't, don't like? Well, the biggest thing I notice first off is uh, sustained, sustained energy. So for example, I can extend 
mental focus. I don't get a blood sugar drop. I don't have a crash. And, and that's one of the big advantages. The other thing, it seems to be able to accelerate uh, fat loss. So I'm able to stay more muscular uh, while losing body fat on a calorie restriction diet without suffering the muscle mass. Because if you're a natural athlete, one of the biggest issues is when you're dieting, to, you know, to lose body fat. And I go through cycles through the, through the year. I'll, I'll, I'll do an experimentation like I did an experimentation uh, the first of last year and took my body weight down literally 38 pounds in 12 weeks. And then I did another experiment later in the year to, to, to see how much I could gain in the similar, in, in a similar amount of time. And I gained about 30 pounds and I think 12 weeks. Now keep in mind, I'm an advanced trainer and I've had a lot of experience. And so I'm just experimenting with different diets. As far as, uh, the brands, uh, I, 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 gee, I can't even remember the names of them at the moment. I'd have to put it in the show notes. Great. We'll do, we'll do that. So tell us about, about amino acids versus enzymes. You mentioned that along the way. Yeah. So amino acids are what your body utilizes to build muscle tissue, to build the polypeptide chains that run your neurochemicals um, and repair organs, all that sort of stuff. So, And also amino acids are used in firing off certain metabolic fat burning processes and things like that. So, and that's what your muscle, that, that's what your muscles actually need. Your muscles don't need protein. They need amino acids. So the process of converting protein into amino acids uh, it, it happens in your digestive canal. It starts with first chewing the food, food enters into the upper cardiac portion of the stomach. And at that time, this is where the enzymes naturally present in the food are supposed to break down the proteins into usable amino acids. Unfortunately, humans are the only species on the planet that eat their food, most of their food cooked. So kind of, we're kind of linking the things why I originally went to a raw food diet is the ability to convert to uh, amino acids either of having, because the enzymes are present in live food, if you're getting it locally and it hasn't been, you know, irradiated and it hasn't been sprayed and all these different things that happen to it, which is kind of rare if you look at it now. Um, so I always supplement with dietary enzymes. In fact, that, that's how I got into the whole enzyme thing. I fixed my digestion using enzymes and probiotics after I had that big weight gain, took me a few six months, I rebuilt my body, rebuilt my health and felt great and then started researching this. And then I cultivated and developed with my business partner, a proteolytic enzyme brand that, that contained five different amino acids or excuse me, five different types of enzymes so that it would break the amino, the protein into amino acids as the hydrochloric acid came in in the second part of digestion and change the pH level because different proteins will cleave into amino acids at different stages uh, or different levels of pH. And then it buffers uh, coming out of the intestine with bicarbonate buffers or fancy name for minerals. And then it goes into the intestinal tract. And that's where the probiotics inside the microbiome will then further break down that protein inside the body. Enzymes will also exert a, a, a proteolytic effect inside the blood, as does a particular probiotic strain, which we cultivated with Dr. O'Brien, which is um, a, a super strain of, of an L plantarum, which we call P3OM, which has been it's been an enhanced process in order to make it break down and digest protein because undigested protein is what causes inflammation in the body, what causes aging inside the body, degeneration, and also serves as a feeding ground for the bad bacteria that, you know, make all sorts of nasty things in our body that lead to, uh, you know, inflammation and damage over time. What is your process for, for testing on yourself in this way? That's well, there's a multi, I would say there's uh, multi-variable tests so first and foremost, and this is something that anybody can do, is get a journal. And the first thing you should do before you do anything is just write down what you eat, how you feel, exercise, you know, and, and, and daily stress life for at least seven days. So you get a full week. Two weeks is even better. And just start tracking your natural patterns of, did I feel tired? Was I energized? Did I need coffee at that time? Or did I... That was I sore in the morning, like all of these kind of markers that are indicative of a lot of other things. And then on top of that, what you can do is you can start stacking tests. So for example, uh, 23andMe, you can do, and there's a variety of other ones, you can do a genetic testing. Uh, you can do an epigenetics test so that you can know what foods that you don't metabolize very well. There's also hormone paddles that you can get interpreted by your naturopathic physician. So I have a naturopathic physician who helps me monitor those levels, which I do regularly. Um, 
And then uh, for people who are sensitive to blood sugar, have blood sugar issues, you could do a gluconometer, which will measure blood sugar levels. So you can see which foods um, metabolize well for you or which ones don't. Those are, those are great, great variances. Um, you can do sleep tech uh, with the Oura Ring uh, is a great technology where you can monitor your, you know, what, how, what's your deep sleep, what's your rapid movement sleep, how many times you woke up, things like that. Uh, heart rate vari variability uh, is another component. And then there's just, you know, the physiological feedback. There's also a, a device called the uh, Metatron, uh, which will measure various levels of inflammation or damage in various organs inside the body. That's a great t thing. I also have regular chiropractic care. So my chiropractor will give indications, for example, if, you know, if I'm blowing out ribs, so thyroid's low or you know, liver is being sluggish or the gallbladder is not functioning. Like he can tell based on how my body's responding in, in the chiropractic care. I call him the wizard, by the way. And then from that, I cross correlate. So ultimately, all of these tests lead back to an internalized feedback system that I can pretty much tell anything that's happening in my body without the testing. I just use the testing now to more or less confirm and to create a body of work over the long term, which I can resource in the future. For your normal uh, diet, are you adding aminos and enzymes at the same time? Yes, as as supplements. Yeah, and I'll take I'll take enzymes. I take my proteolytic enzymes before I work out too. Whether that's and that's for people if they're doing an endurance training or muscle building training because they'll both enhance the effectiveness of those workouts. It's, it's pretty thing. The other thing is it also speeds recovery. So I'll take them on an empty stomach. I'll take them with my amino acids and I'll take them before my meals. What's your perspective on the microbiome, microbiome testing? We've had other guests who talk a lot about that uh, category. So how have you uh, explored the microbiome? Yeah, we do uh, gut map testing, biome test. Uh, there's a couple new ones out on the market as well. So we kind of cross correlate as well as the ones that they run through um, with your doctor. Um, so there'll be, you know, the stool, typical stool stamp, samples to see what active um, microbiome that you have. And you, again, you have to build up over a body work because all of these tests, everything from a blood test to a microbiome test, these are very dynamic uh, environments that change literally meal per meal per meal. And so oftentimes there's a danger in getting a little bit of information because it can be circumvent with whatever's happening at that immediate time and not a relative picture of the long term. So you want to build up uh, and, and do a variety of these testings and see what it picks, picks up. But I think the microbiome is a is we're we're starting to scratch the surface. The testing is now becoming available for people at a lower lower price. And the bottom line is this: uh, these little guys are. And when I'm saying these little guys, the the microbiome constitutes both the external skin and the internal skin with the bacteria cultures that are essential to life. The non essential ones, the ones that are you know, we're not sure what they do. And then there's the other ones that are, which we know are absolutely totally bad for you. And we're some balance of those. I call the 10, 80, 10, 10, good, 10, bad, and 80% opportunists, depending on the circumstances. And so making sure that you keep that in check is probably the easiest and fastest way to ensure that you don't develop the life debilitating conditions that so often happen. If you look at right now, 75 million Americans today are suffering from some form of digestive related illness and 12% of emergency hospital visits are related to gastrointestinal issues. And those things didn't start overnight. They started over a period of time in the erosion of the microbiome because of bad diets, antibacterial stuff, antibiotics, and the lack of uh, putting in fermented foods and high strain, uh, high grade strains of probiotics into your system to wipe out the bad guys. What do you think, based on your research, are what you would call superfoods? So foods that are particularly good, given that everybody's body is different, everybody's microbiome is different. What do you believe are sort of these foods that like everybody should be eating? Well, I think the biggest thing is um, anytime that you can get a food that has been grown in nature in its natural environment um, – is a without chemicals is usually going to have what I call superfood potential. And what that means is if you look at the research from the 1900s, I'll give you a, a, a real data example. Uh, the U S Congress was worried about the degradation of protein inside a wheat. Now at the time wheat was at 90% protein and now it's less than 7% commercial farming, uh, fertilization, um, genetic modification 
has altered that food to a point it's nothing like it was originally. That's how people could live hundreds of years ago on bread. And today, if you ate that, you'd be dead in a very short period of time. You know, if you just lived on bread, you'd be nutrient deficient and everything. And so most of the crops and food that people are consuming on a day-to-day basis, whether it's organic, whether it's conventional, whether it's genetically modified, even non-GMO, most of this stuff has actually been grown on monoculture farms in unnatural environments. So what you have bred is a, a lot of weak strains that don't contain the nutrients. I read somewhere recently that a, a peach from 1950, you'd have to eat like 50 peaches now to get the same nutrient content of that peach 50 years ago. And so the calorie model, uh, protein, carbohydrates, or its fats, has been very useful for you know monitoring dietary components, but it's not been very effective for monitoring the essential minerals, vitamins, cofactors, phytonutrients that number one, support the body, uh, reduce inflammation and degeneration, and also curb hunger. Because really, I believe that, you know, weight gain and obesity and the, the, the struggles that people are having, depression, and everything are actually related to severe deficiencies in the body. And so back to the question about the superfoods, are there ones that, that come to mind for you, which says not only where does it come from and is it grown in a specific way? What are the foods that are, that are most exciting? Or if you were to give advice to people, say, please start adding this and this and this to your diet. Well, my personal favorite, I'll just give you my personal favorite, but I'm from a northern climate. Uh, I mean, I, wild blueberries, I could eat, a, a, you know, literally sit down and eat a flat of those any day of the week. <laughs> I think those are good. I think uh, if you can get something in your local environment, that has been oftentimes it's called wild crafted. So if you were in, you know, Tibet or China, various parts of China, you could get, you know, fresh raw goji berries or recently dried. I think those are phenomenal products. If you are in the Himalayas, you might get apricot kernels, um, which is calcium pangamate B15. I think that's a, that's a great one to be munching on. Um, if you can get sprouted almonds or various nuts in a, in a, in a raw sprouted state, I mean, the nutrient profiles of those are very good. Um, when I'm down in, uh, so I travel a lot. So when I'm in Asia, I particularly like uh, things like jackfruit, um, mangoes. Those are the ones that resonate with me. And I'll find other people that don't resonate with that. And that's based on their epigenetics and how they metabolize or methylate various foods. In your travel, what is your go-to, if anything, uh, food that you can get readily, right? A lot of people on the food the salads. Show, travel, they travel a lot. They're challenged by yeah. a new environment, difficult to find. Is there a go-to A, food or B, uh, place to get it? My, my Whole Foods rainbow salad. So one of the things I do, and I, I travel a lot and I've built a really good roadshow. So one of the things that I do is, number one, I carry... Um, I'll, I'll, when I land in a place, I drive to the whole foods or to the natural health food store, whatever's in that area. And I get myself a giant salad right off the bat. So I want to ground with those nutrients and I want to get what I can. And then I'll start picking up all of the essential things that I need. So I'll, I'll carry a good vegetarian protein power, my vegetarian amino acids. I like to get uh, a really good oil lately. I got to say a bit, uh, shout out to my friend, Ian Clark in activation oils. Uh, they might be one, I think they are the best oils I've ever tried. I'm a, a big fan of Udo's oil, but I think activation has gone another level on that. They've got a v- wide variety of oils I've been using lately. Like their black cumin oil is absolute. Like it's, you taste this or their amaranth drops that you can drop on your tongue and like you, you just feel it in your brain almost instantly. So that's, that's how powerful they are. And when you've had a non denatured, um, uh, oil, then it's a completely different game than anything else. So that stuff, I'll, I'll get some sprouted nuts. Uh, almonds are great because they're low glycemic. They're very easy to carry. You can kind of munch on a few of them. Well, they have to watch that you just don't eat the whole bag. And uh, and the other thing I like a lot is uh, apples. I'm a big fan of Fuji apples as a as is was probably my favorite apple. And I'll grab those things and kind of just munch on those when I travel around as well. You've, you've incorporated meditation and mindfulness a lot into your practice and lifestyle. Maybe you can expand on that. Yeah. So um, I guess I had my first big existential crisis in the year 2000. And uh, I had read a book by, called Autobiography of Yogi, which was written by a guy by the name of Paramahansa Yogananda, the first yogi to live extensively in the West around, he came here in 1920. 
lived here for, I think, 35 years and um, developed a whole system of meditation. So I got that and really started embracing that in early 2001. And uh, since that time, I've cultivated a number of practices in that realm, uh, which I do each and every day. And uh, I think it's probably the biggest, the thing that makes the most difference in um, peace, tranquility, perspective, um, also reduction of uh, lowering of the heart rate, blood pressure, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, I'm not a big endurance athlete, but I have a, a heart rate that's down around in, in the, you know, in the, in the low thirties to, or excuse me, high thirties to low forties when I wake up in the morning and I'm, I'm not a big cardio, uh, big cardio, I do sprinting and stuff, but that's it. And I, I largely attribute that to deep breathing and meditation practice. What is your advice for people who are interested, but I'd say not yet practicing on meditation? Well, you know, you got to start small. And the first thing that people do when they start is they go, oh my God, I can't keep my focus or concentration, all these thoughts coming in. And the reality is, is no, you're actually just stepping away. Uh, and if I would say that, sort of speak, stepping away and, and, and actually watching the thoughts and watching the mind. So at that moment, you start to realize after a little while, well, wait a second, if I'm watching my thoughts or I'm watching my feelings, then I must not be my thoughts and I must not be my feelings. So who am I? Who is this person, the ghost in the machine who is observing all this? And if it's independent of the machine, well, then what's that all about? And that becomes a whole trip and will probably lead you to listening to Alan Watts at 1.30 in the morning about Zen and that sort of thing. <laughs> And so for you, probably it's hard for you to, to think back to the days when you weren't doing regular meditation, but for people maybe in your, in, in your life that are starting that, what do you feel like is the immediate benefit? A lot of people I talk to, they start meditating and they stop meditating because either their life gets in the way or they don't perceive a benefit. So what might be the short-term benefits of for the earlier yet practicing, not yet practicing meditation? Well, the first thing I think is to recognize that the goal isn't to go anywhere. So a lot of people are in today's world are all driven by performance and optimization and get more done and do less and be amazing and all this sort of uh, clickbait things that are put out there. And, and the role of meditation, if you start in the Eastern philosophy and start to understand the etymology of how it emerged out of India and then China and, and into Jen and uh, into Zen and the, Japan, and, and then it made its way to the West and its various interpretations the goal is the goal is the process sitting down and stopping and and at first it's it, it almost seems backwards you, you it appears you go backwards instead of forwards and that's where a lot of people get frustrated because they go i can't sit for that long I, I you know i can't get my breathing i can't watch my concentration and that in itself is the benefit because the first thing that you have to realize is that you're not in control of these things and that this whole state of being in this digital world is creating an anxiety in you that's a low-level anxiety that can be picked up in your health, in your internal organs. You can put it on EKGs. You can see a stress response, fight or flight response. All of these things are indicative of the state that you're in. So it appears that you're going backwards. Now you're starting to build a base, just like we're doing testing in health. You're now getting a baseline of where your natural, everyday, ordinary state is. Um, inside of this, the easiest way to get going is to focus on breathing practices. And number one, super oxygenating the body, getting a lot of oxygen in will start to reduce the, the need for breaths. And then eventually, especially if you have a technique, there's a variety of techniques out there that you can use and utilize. A technique will allow you to bring the mind back to a particular repetitive process, whether that's a mantra, whether that's a a breathing style like box breathing or a, 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 a mantric breath, then from there, you'll start to get senses of space and calmness. And then eventually revelation will start to hit you about what this whole thing called life's all about. So I think the key, and this is so hard for Westerners to get, is to not look for a benefit. It sounds kind of inverted to how most people think, but if you're looking for a benefit, you're chasing something and you're back into the mind again. If you're just, you do the practice to do the practice, the benefits will come out of it by not looking for the benefits. You be, and, and the benefits is a form of awareness, which is not necessarily in the conscious mind, which is leveraging the unconscious. And we're a very conscious mind focused society 
even though we do a lot of things unconsciously, we think of, I'm going to concentrate now. I'm going to think I'm going to sit down here and really focus on this meditation. Well, that's actually going to take you out of it. What are some very specific techniques that you use in your own meditation practice? Okay, great. So it's a good question. I think a lot of, I don't actually get asked asked that one. So here's what I do. Um, I begin with a series of energization exercises, which are 32 specific energization exercises. People don't have to do this, but uh, where I tense and relax uh, the muscles of my body. So what people can do really quickly, though, is they can sit down with their spine upright, uh, upright as best they can in a, in a comfortable chair with their back not against the chair back and hands at the juncture of the thighs and abdomen. And what you do is you take a double inhale like a and you as you do that, you tense all the muscles of the body from your feet all the way up as, to every muscle that you can hold it. And then you exhale in a double exhale and you do that four or five times. Now, the reason that you're doing it is by tensing the muscle, you'll actually increase electrical energy. But as soon as you relax, you have, if there's tension in the body, you'll relax. And the, the first key to success in meditation is through relaxation. It's counterintuitive. You want to get yourself into out of the fight or flights, which most people are in almost all the time in the modern world. And so you go from there to, to, to that place and then I would start one of the easiest ways to super oxygenate. And I have, you know, I, I wonder about this with people do this with caution. You want to be sitting down when you do this is you can start uh, deep breathing, like <sighs> kind of like the Wim Hof stuff, deep breaths, exhales really, really rapidly for maybe 30 to seconds to a minute. And then as the, as the oxygen goes out, you can do things like box breathing, which would be like a count where you're doing an inhale for, let's say five, um, hold for five, exhale for five and inhale for five. And as you get good at that, you just keep increasing the time till you get to like, you know, 20 or 30 seconds and inhale 20 or 30 seconds on the exhale, that sort of thing. And then after that, uh, I do another pr- process called hung saw, which is I, 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 I breathe in and I chant hung and I exhale saw. And it's, it's, it's a silent meditation from there. Those practices on their own. And, and then when the breathing st- will slow down all on its own and you'll start getting these long gaps between breaths. Um, and over time that becomes kind of a very euphoric, peaceful state. And, uh, that's that. And then I do some specific, uh, technique related, um, meditations where I'm revolving chi or prana, if you want to call it through the spine, up through the spinal column into the, into the brain and back down. And these are not what might people might think of them as esoteric practices, but you can legitimately actually feel this and measure it on brainwave scans and these type of things. So, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about the water and the water product that you've built and perspectives on water. So, um, I do a, I, I, there's a great video out there called water, the great mystery, and you can get it online and it's the top water researchers of about a decade ago. And they're going through, um, the water and, and why they call it a great mystery. So these are people that have been, you know, at the highest levels of intellect have been studying water for the last 40, 50 years. And one of the guys comes out and says, well, the first thing I want to tell you about water is I, we don't know that much. <laughs> and, uh, having met Dr. Pollock, who wrote a, a, a wonderful book called cells, gels, and the engines of life. And has actually proved that water has four phases and exists as a solid, a liquid, a gas, and a crystal. Um, indicates that w- water is a lot more. It's, it's got all these unique chemical properties that no other substance has. It's, it seems to be essential to life, at least on this planet. Uh, it's a storage information, uh, house of storage information panels. They know of at least 440,000 information panels. So the way that you know your emotions, the way you, that you feel or remember where your keys are related to the storage capacity of water. So it's much more than something that you drink and stay hydrated with. It's actually what I would consider it is a, it's like a DVD. And so out there in the world today, there is everybody that is trying to talk about their water. Is it bottled water? Is it, is it electrolyzed water? Do you want high pH water? Do you want low pH water? Do you want spring water? Do you want enhanced water? Do you want, you know, all these companies and businesses and stuff are marketing um, the water that they have as some unique properties. And everybody's trying to prove that their water is better than the other person, which is a typical uh, kind of dominance mentality that is pervasive in the animal and human kingdoms. And I I understand that, but what I would invite people to think and consider first is what if everybody was right? And what I mean by that, if you took a DVD 
and that you're going to listen to. And so I'm dating myself here because some people don't, don't use DVDs or never had, but you put a DVD and you can store information on that. So you can store uh, a horror movie. You can store a sports film. You can store your family wedding. Uh, you could store a documentary on that and put it in the video and it plays. Well, water is work very similar. So the mechanism or devices that you are using to interact with the water are storing information. That information may be interpreted as, a, you know, a electrical potential may be turned as uh, a level of hydrogen components. It might have frequencies stored within the water. It might be the absence of minerals, the presence of minerals, all of these different things would be determining what is stored on that information packet or that information storage device. So if you look at the molecule as a, as a storage device, that every one of these people have a way of programming in a way that can have both positive or negative uh, no, negative aspects or components as, as, as in report it to the health of your body or the performance components you're going for. So for me, I've investigated about 150 plus different types of water uh, from various people. And I see the benefits of, of a variety of them. But one of the things that I did know is that uh, I use a machine. It's made by a company called Enagic. It's called a Kongan water machine. And uh, of all the technologies I have found, I found that it was the most robust and applicable to the most amount of people. Not to discredit anybody else's water or stuff, but what I liked is it made five different types of water, water that I can disinfect Anything with it can make a 2.5 pH waters, or actually it's about 2.3, which will kill anything under 2.7 will kill any bacteria. So you can spray it on your food. You can use it as a as an agent instead of alcohol to disinfect things. Um, it's it's a phenomenal product. Sore throats, things like that with kids, uh, eye sores, things like that. All kinds of stuff. You can put this 2.5 skin conditions. So that was good. It made three different types of drinking water that you could that had various um, levels of ionic capacity. So a lot of people talk about pH. It's not really the pH that's important. There's, there's, there's alkaline water, which is a high pH, pH over seven and acidic water would be under seven and over seven. You can make a water that's up to 9.5. These are drinking waters, but it's not the pH that makes the difference. It is the, the electrical based ions that are, that are created from a hydrolysis process, which is you're putting an electric current through the water, separating the water with a platinum plated device that, that puts the negative ions on one stream and the positive ions under the other. And of course, these have been proven by a guy by the name of Dr. Horst Filzer, who put the first stent in the body. He proved in human conditions that this improved mitochondrial function. That's the energy furnace of the body, reduced inflammation and served as an electrical anti-based ox antioxidant. So that was great that he did that. That research came out just a, uh, a year and a half ago. I, I actually felt that and measured it in my own world. But of course, that wasn't double blind study. I knew enough that it made a difference. I could train harder, faster, longer drinking that water. The other benefits are they can make a water like your skin's around 5.5 to 6.0. So you could wash your face in that water and had a toning effect. Like women use toners that you could use that. And then it made it, at, I, I mentioned before the 2.5 or the, uh, excuse me, it made 11.5 water, which emulsifies oil. So I like to have these big salads and we know that even if you're buying organics, uh, the USDA allows 50 different chemicals on organics. You might have been on a truck where it got sprayed or all kinds of stuff. And most of these pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, which interrupt the enzymatic activity of living organisms, that's how it kills them, uh, are on our food. So my question is, how much of that food do you have to eat? Well, this device makes an 11.5 pH water that is uh, slippery enough, if you will, it actually feels slippery under the fingers, that will emulsify oil. So you heard the old thing, water and oil won't mix. Well, actually, water and oil will mix if you have a sufficiently high uh, pH that has been cultivated through an electrolysis process. The machine does that. And so I wash all my fruits and vegetables within that. And number one, it lets them stay in the fridge much longer, anywhere from going from two days to two weeks. And number two, it um, it removes those oil-based pesticides. So you see the stuff come off the drain and, and you're going, wow, that's like all weird. And they go, that's the stuff that was in that plant that I did had no idea about. And I think those chemical agents are very disruptive to people's health and microbiomes. So do you utilize five different types of water in your, your daily life? Yeah, absolutely. And how do you, I heard one that you use with what, maybe you could just summarize that in terms of the type one, type two, and, and what you use them for. Yeah. So I use the 2.5 acid water for disinfecting. I use the 5.5 water for skin toning, washing my face. 
or you can put it on your hair, it makes your hair shiny. Uh, then I use the, the 8.5 to 9.5 uh, pH drinking waters um, to improve my recovery and function in the body, and reduce inflammation. And then I use the 11.5 water to emulsify any oils that may be on uh, the food that I eat. You can also use it as a cleaning agent as well. You can wash your clothes with 11.5 with a little bit of lavender and it serves as detergent. So very good for the environment. You don't need any of those soaps and chemicals and things that are harmful for it and, and a wide variety of range. So far as the applications for it, I thought it was very well versatile. Uh, is it the be all and end all? No. Is it the probably the most functional water system that you can find? I, I think so. And this is a this is a device that someone could buy and utilize in their home. Yeah, I mean the technology has been around since the 1960s, uh, very popular in Japan. And then there was a company that created a home home unit. Uh, Sony did their their uh, company, and then uh, a company out of Japan emerged out of that called Enagic, and they've been doing that for 45 years. Home use. There's a lot of other ionizers, but I like that one in particular because they've got service centers all around the world, so they can go back and you know, get it deep cleaned. And if there's any repairs that's required, I, I've had mine for 13 years. It's been great. Fun fact, Dr. Pollock, who you mentioned, his son co-founded a company with me. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. He, I, I had a wonderful uh, dinner with him at the Bulletproof conference a couple of years ago, and I loved his answer. Uh, I said, so Dr. Pollock, in your opinion, what's, what's, what's the best water for, for humans? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> you know, he's a super genius and just an amazing guy. He's a, he's a lovely, he's a lovely person and a lovely scientist. Yeah, a real scientist, I might add. He's not caught in the dogma uh, of that, that this current scientific system is suffering from, where it's funded by special interest groups that are desiring or designing experiments to prove certain components. And if people don't believe that, they can check out uh, Rupert Sheldrake's The Ten. Uh, dogmas of science. And it's, it, you know, science has unfortunately emerged into sort of a crony capitalistic religion, as opposed to what it was originally designed for, which is, hey, you take a hypothesis, you, and you test that hypothesis and see what comes out. And uh, now it's emerged in, in something else. And I, I'm hoping it goes back to what it was originally designed for. Well, shout out to Dr. Pollock and, and his son, Seth, who, are, who doesn't fall very far from the tree, is both a, a, a kind person, a thoughtful person, and a, and a scientist in his own right. That's awesome. Uh, let's do a few rapid fire questions and um, when you're ready. So if money were no object, what personal therapies would you try? All of them. <laughs> give us one. That, give us one again. Money, no object. You could say, "I'm going to go do this therapy in this place, and we're paying for it." Um, you know, I would probably think CRISPR genes. I think gene manipulations probably would be where it's at. The thing was, is I, I don't know if I would roll the dice on it unless I had a lot of money to be pretty certain what the result was going to be. <laughs> it sort of ties into my next question: If your personal safety were guaranteed. What would you try, or you had no long-term health effects? What would you try? Uh, obviously, gene splicing would probably be the, the 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 most productive one. I think where the most future is. Cool. And if I gave you five million dollars that you had to invest in another company in this space, what would it be? It may not be a specific company, but a specific technology. Uh, I would say stem cells. What books or podcasts do you recommend to other people that that want to follow more into your category of uh, of thinking? Well, there's a couple of them. Um, so people can go check out my awesome health podcast. So I interview the people that I learn from. Uh, but I think some of the two of the leaders out there, Ben Greenfield is extraordinary. Um, Dave Asprey, Bulletproof Radio um, is also doing some great work. Those two guys are at, at the cutting edge. And then uh, about every fifth podcast, uh, Tim Ferriss has some great stuff. So those are the those are the big standards. And actually, Joe Rogan gets a lot of good. Uh, he gets a lot of good health guests as well. Uh, um, I think Dr. Uh, I think Stana Patrick, she, she's got some great stuff on the microbiome and genetics and, uh, she's, she's a real hardcore scientist. So I, I, I think she's great. Oh, Dr. Cruz. That's the other, the other guy. If you're really into the science, he's, he's another one. He's a, he, he's, he's fantastic. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to now list off a bunch of different therapies or treatments. And I'd love for you to sort of respond quickly. Like I've never heard of it. I've tried it. Uh, I think it's super useful or I think it's, uh, it's hogwash. Okay. So gut or microbiome testing. Great. Performance blood testing from maybe a company like inside tracker or others. 
Excellent. IPS cell banking. Never tried it. Intermittent fasting we've already done. Longer fast, say greater than three days. Done it. Think it's great. Or a sleep tracking ring. Fantastic. NAD. Probably one of the most promising uh, intravenous uh, methodologies that you can use. Telomere testing or lengthening. I'm undecided about the 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 effects of that, but uh, I think it's worth I think it's worth experimenting with. Hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Uh, started that 20 years ago. I think it's fantastic. Uh, EMS or electromuscular stimulation exercise. Uh, you know, I just hooked my dad up recently for some pain. Uh, that he was experiencing, and it worked extraordinarily. And then there's uh, there's there's various levels, and microcurrent, I think, is the leading edge of that. Uh, you can go to the Thorpe Institute for that. PRP. Fantastic. Nootropics? Use them all the time. What's your favorite? I think the most baseline for people, I think, is uh, the Aracetam. I think is probably the cleanest and most universal. Each with neurotropics, there's going to be a, a wide variance. Uh, that in lion's mane for memory, I think is uh, fantastic. There's a variety of mushroom products. I mean, I, I, we could spend all day on that neutro- neurotropics, but I always like to look at standards. Nicotine. Um, you know, it's an incredible neurotropic. I've used it. My concern is the vasoconstriction over a long period of time, but there's no doubt there's a, there's a definite benefit to it uh, from a cognitive level. Brain computer interface. I think it's uh, going to be inevitable. Well, how how f- close to the front of the line will you be? If you could say you could you could connect into your brain and we could have either put thoughts in or take thoughts out. Well, uh, I, I've already done pretty advanced brain training where I'm hooked into computers for days, so I think I'm already been there, been there, done that. Uh, what does something that you believe strongly that most people who are quote unquote experts in the space do not? I think that uh, a plant-based diet is superior over uh, other forms of fur longevity. So where can people find out more about you online? Yeah, they can check out uh, bioptimizers.com slash live to 200. Uh, that will give you a Access to my 12-week awesome health course, absolutely free, no charge. And I, inside of that, I have 84 different uh, videos set in a sequential manner so that you can start to learn and learn from all the people I learn. I cite all the references so you can kind of dive deeper on a topic or you can kind of jump around from the topics of interest. So I, I'm standing on the, on the sh- I would say, on the shoulders of greatness. And so I try to refer to all the people that I learn from and then do so in a systematic way so that people aren't wasting, they know how to to spend their time, their energy, and their resources in a way that helps them get the most value out of the least amount of expenditures. Wade, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge today. And uh, here's to living to 200. Hey, good luck. I'm, I'm going for it. You've been listening to another episode of How to Live to 200. Thank you so much for joining me and exploring this world together. I get a ton of help from the L200 crew that includes Lauren Krayinski and Kevin Kirkpatrick. The theme music is composed by Emmett McCann. Yes, that's my nephew. You can learn more about this and other episodes at our website, livingto200.com, or find us on Twitter or Instagram at How to Live to 200 where we post lots of photos of cool things. It's early days for this podcast, so we would appreciate any and all comments or telling a friend or two about what we're doing over here. It might be irresponsible for you to keep it a secret. Until next time, eat right, get lots of sleep, keep good numbers, and be looking around the corner for the next big breakthrough. If we're going to live a long time, we better do it well.